Now we're ready to expand on our knowledge of electric dipoles by imagining if we have a bunch of them together. Imagine if we take this insulating block of material and we just stick it between an isolated charged parallel plate capacitor. What would happen? This insulating block is surely full of molecules, right? Otherwise it wouldn't exist. And we remember that externally applied electric fields have the effect of making nonpolar molecules behave like dipoles or polar molecules. In that case, this block's full of a bunch of molecules. They don't even have to be dipoles and their orientations could be totally random for all we care. But in the presence of an electric field that exists between these capacitor plates here, the molecules become polarized dipoles in some manner, and the dipoles align at least slightly in the direction of the electric field. Namely, the positive charge concentrations tend to move in the direction of the electric field, and the negative charge concentrations tend to move against the direction of the In practice, the usual way of modeling this effect is considering the dielectric itself to remain neutral, but the charge is now polarized on the left and right surfaces, which kind of makes some sense, right? Because imagine if you had like a solid with totally aligned sets of positive and negative charge like this. There's no net polarization in this solid as we see it here. But introducing an electric field is going to displace the positive charge in one direction and the negative charge in the other direction. At this point, it's not totally out of the question and thinking maybe if we just sort of kind of ignored this middle part, which is not really all that polarized, we end up with positive surface polarization on the right surface and negative surface polarization of charge on the left surface. Now what about the electric potential energy of this block? At the very instant we introduce the electric field, everything is non-polarized, or in the case of polar dipoles, randomly oriented in all directions, so as to result in a net electric dipole moment of zero. So it turns out this state right here actually has a higher electric potential energy than a few moments after the electric field is introduced. After we've waited a small while, the electric field has done positive work on the collection of molecules on average, moving charges in the direction they want to go in. So this has the effect of reducing the total electric potential energy within the block. If that's not convincing, another way of looking at it is if we have polarized dipoles instead with random orientations, then on average the dipoles are pointing in all directions, so the net electric potential energy of the dipoles might be, say, zero. But once they're in the presence of an electric field, the dipoles partially align in the field's direction, and the electric potential energy of each dipole gets weaker, as we saw in the previous lesson, remember? If the dipole moment vector of each dipole points more towards the electric field's direction, its potential energy is weaker. Once the electric field has had some time to act on these molecules, it performs positive work on the dipoles, reducing their potential energies, and thus the overall electric potential energy of the system. So we see then that, no matter what, introducing the insulating block has the effect of reducing the electric potential energy of the capacitor system. Now, how are we supposed to explain this? What is the electric potential energy of the capacitor system we have before we insert this insulator, or this dielectric? This gives us a good chance to introduce what a dielectric is. A dielectric is just a fancy way of describing an insulator. Usually the term dielectric is used in the context of capacitors, like when we insert insulating material between the conductors that make up a capacitor. Now then, the electric potential energy, we remember we can write it like these three expressions before we introduce the dielectric. But after introducing this insulating block, or this dielectric, we've reduced the potential energy within the capacitor. But because the block is insulating, nothing actually happens to the charge on each plate. There's still no mechanism for charge to flow provided the electric field isn't super strong, and the capacitor itself is still an isolated system. And that's actually the key here. Initially, the capacitor has some charge Q0, some potential difference across it, delta V0, and some capacitance C0, given by Q0 over delta V0. After the dielectric is inserted, we have a different potential difference between the plates, a different capacitance too, but the same charge. So if we write the potential energy across the capacitor once the dielectric has been inserted, 
the energy we know has decreased from our previous discussion. So taking the expression 1 half Q delta V, since Q stays the same, it must be the case that the potential difference between the plates decreases. What about the capacitance? If we take Q squared over 2C as the energy, the energy has decreased, the charge has stayed the same, so the capacitance must have increased as a result. We could have also come to that conclusion just by looking at C equals Q over delta V. If Q stays the same and delta V must decrease, then the capacitance has to increase as a result. Very interesting. So we've explained the consequence of inserting the dielectric via a potential energy approach, but what about if we consider a more electric field-like approach? Do we come to the same set of conclusions? Consider again the fact that the dielectric is polarized on its left and right sides. This means that the dielectric actually creates its own mini-induced electric field to counteract the stronger electric field created by the conducting plates on the outside, as if the dielectric were its own mini-weaker parallel plate capacitor. We see then that the magnitude of the electric field between the two plates after inserting the dielectric, or E sub F, is the electric field that we started out with, E naught, minus the newly induced electric field inside of the dielectric. The electric field between the plates is now weaker thanks to the dielectric, and we recall that the magnitude of the electric potential difference between the two plates is just ED. So if the distance between the two plates stays the same, and the electric field gets weaker, the relative potential difference also gets weaker. If the charge on the capacitor stays the same, it must be the case that the capacitance increases as a result. So that's great. We arrived at the same set of conclusions, whether we thought about the electrical energy or the electric field. Everything ended up being consistent. That's all the intuition or the qualitative aspects, but now we have to think about how should we quantify all this. I believe that, amazingly, this is one of those situations where the qualitative aspects are actually quite difficult to get to grips with. But the quantitative aspects are so simple, it almost looks ridiculous how simple they are. So if you've understood most of what we've just talked about up to here, all of the qualitative stuff or all of the intuition, then give yourself a pat on the back for making it this far, because the rest is going to be smooth sailing. If not, always remember nothing's stopping you from re-watching this video or any of the previous videos for that matter and you'll always learn something new on a rewatch. Provided the electric field between the capacitor's plates is not super strong, the way the effect of the dielectric is usually modeled is the new electric field is just whatever the original electric field was, but divided by this new factor kappa, which is greater than one for all normal materials. Kappa is what we call the dielectric constant of the dielectric that we insert. It changes depending on what type of material the insulator is made out of. Usually in higher level physics classes, you'll see this thing called epsilon 2, which is defined as the relative permittivity. All it is is just kappa times epsilon naught, where we already know what epsilon naught is. So from here on out, we're just only going to be dealing with kappa under the assumption that you should be able to fill in the details if your class is working with epsilon instead, just by using this relationship we see here. Going back to the electric field relationship we have here, the assumption that the new electric field is proportional to the old electric field by some constant greater than 1, which depends on the material, this assumption is actually the only assumption we need to make here. The rest of the math will just magically fall into place. If we know that the electric field decreases after inserting a dielectric, then kappa has to be greater than 1, so that the new electric field is smaller than the old electric field. Since the potential difference is ED in terms of magnitude, and D doesn't change, that means the potential difference can be written the same way as the electric field. The potential difference decreases by this large dividing factor kappa. If the charge stays the same after inserting a dielectric, then what happens to the capacitance? The new capacitance can be written as the old charge divided by the new potential difference. 
but the new potential difference is just the old potential difference divided by kappa. In that case, the new capacitance is kappa times the old capacitance. The capacitance has actually increased by a factor of kappa after inserting the dielectric. The final variable we have to consider is the electric potential energy. How does it change? We know it's supposed to decrease, but how? Using Q0 squared over 2C0 as the original potential energy, the new potential energy is the same charge Q0 squared, but now divided by 2 times the new capacitance, which is kappa times C0. In that case, the new electric potential energy is smaller than the original by this dividing factor kappa. And that concludes all our properties of isolated capacitors. In the case that our capacitor isn't isolated, we're going to have to shuffle some of these properties a bit. Like consider if the capacitor is connected to a battery, and while it's connected to a battery, we insert a dielectric in between. What happens now? In that case, the potential difference across the capacitor stays the same, right? It's just whatever the potential difference across the battery is. But the capacitance has to increase across the capacitor to become kappa times C0, because that is the capacitance of a capacitor with this dielectric inserted. What actually happens here is we don't have an isolated capacitor, so the charge doesn't stay constant. Instead, the charge would increase to kappa times Q0, with the explanation being that there are attracting dipoles in between, so the capacitor itself can support more charge from the battery across its plates, which are attracted to these dipoles. And that's really all there is to it.